Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 174. This episode is with Brant Russell. He is a singer, Emerson College alumni, husband to previous podcast guest Kristen Bates, and he's just awesome. I've known Brant for a few years now, and having him on the show was super long overdue, so I was super excited to get the chance to hang out with him. He did not disappoint. In this episode, we talk about him growing up actually singing in Texas before touring the Western U.S. and college with an a cappella group. We talk about him traveling to South Africa, how awesome that was, what a springbok is, going to grad school in Boston, the process of writing his capstone, why the words we use are so important, and so much more. It's a fascinating chat with a fascinating dude, and I think you're really going to like it. So, without further ado, let's just jump right into this. Please enjoy this episode of The Interesting Podcast, number 174, with Brent Russell. Theme song time. doing are you are you thawed are you frozen talk to me man it's nuts up here so i'm from um i'm from dallas right originally um and then i went to college up in oklahoma city which is like essentially north dallas sure and then <laughs> um yeah and then we moved up here to boston what four years ago i think wow or close yeah close to four years ago and i mean we had snow in dallas but like we would get maybe like a centimeter of snow sure and everything would shut down and <laughs> like so it was great being sure. in, in school at the time because it's like oh yeah snow day yeah I bet. um there's funny there's like this uh it's you know, so such low stakes but there's like this conspiracy theory that the superintendent of our school district he drove a hummer and if he could get to to his office in his hummer we had to go to school that day and we <laughs> all the believed metric. it. Yeah. Yeah. We all believe it. Oh yeah, man. That sounds like a, a valid, a valid uh, measurement right there. I so believe it. It's the case. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, uh, we get up to Boston and I mean, it's just a different world yeah. out here. Like, I bet. Yeah. It's, it's nuts. It's absolutely nuts. Um, and so, yeah, we're having a nor'easter and a blizzard today, but the wind is so high uh, is going so fast it's like we you it's hard to explain there's some parts where you can see the grass and then uh -huh. there's other parts where there's mounds of snow that are like seven eight feet tall <gasps> um, because what? the wind has blown it all in a certain place so what? yeah it's nuts like our apartment is we live in the first floor apartment uh -huh. but our floor is like halfway submerged in the ground. I don't, it's hard oh, to explain no. it, but so I look outside my window and vast majority of my window is covered with a mound of snow because we only can have like, you know, two and a half, three feet of visibility outside of our window, just because of how this apartment is shaped and, and with us being on that first floor. But yeah, the, the snow has just built up around there. It's just, it's a different world. And life still goes on here even what? during blizzards and it's like no how I'm, I'm not no <laughs> that's so foreign to me because I, yeah. I grew up i grew up in florida mm -hmm. so we didn't even get snow to begin with and so wait so nor a nor'easter nor'eastern nor'easter 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 yeah. that is different than a blizzard so a nor'easter i don't know a whole lot about weather but same, a nor'easter, from what I understand, a nor'easter is essentially just like a really bad winter storm, but oh. it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily synonymous with a blizzard, but you can get blizzards as a result of the nor'easter. Uh-huh. Um, so I think 
that's the case. Okay. Um, okay. If you have a listener that would like to educate me on this, <laughs> yeah. I'll be okay with that. Listener? Um, Nobody listens to these, Brand. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that's not true. Um, okay. Um, okay. So yeah, it's it's crazy. What part of Florida are you in? I'm in Naples, which is all the way southwest. So if you go That's to like it. Miami, it's mm-hmm. on the same latitude, just on the other coast. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I thought that's where you were. Yeah. All the way down there. So snow is, it's cold and it's wet and mm-hmm. it's nice in pictures. I've, th- the most I've ever been in was I went to New York um, mm-hmm. a few years back and it, re- it snowed like 11 inches overnight. But <laughs> you guys, what are you, what are you at now? Like what's going, what's, what's the snow situation that they're saying? Like there's this much. Um, so last I saw, um, I'm getting my phone out to see if there's any updates. Here we go. Real time. Yes. Real time. Last I saw, we had like over a, okay. So we've had 21 inches of snow in the (gasps) last six hours, Ah! but that's what my iPhone is saying. So if I'm wrong, right. (laughs) But it's hard to Dude. measure that because you know, I was telling you about the wind. So yeah. like, in some places I can still see the grass. So maybe there's like an inch or two of snow there. But in other places, it feels like, you know, there's snow taller than I am. So it's like, how do they measure right. what the snow is? So I have no idea how they do that. But I'm going to trust Tim Cook um, that uh, there's 21 feet of snow. Yeah. Maybe that's 21 <laughs> inches of snow. Yeah, that's what it is. It's 21 inches I like of the snow. feet. Feet's much yes. better. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's feet's just more dramatic. Yeah. <laughs> we've got, a, we've got Can you 1.8 feet of snow. <laughs> That'd be insane. Are you good with the cold? Because Texas gets um, cold, but not super yeah, cold, right? Like, right. Yeah. So, I mean, the coldest I think I ever remember experiencing in Dallas was like 12 degrees, but it mm. is very, very rare that it's ever that cold. And it's really rare that we get like snow. No, in Texas, we get a lot of sleet. Um, gotcha. well, we get like, I'm still in Texas. We got, Texas gets a lot of <laughs> sweet sleet there, which mm-hmm. is um, you know, freezing rain. So it makes driving there very, very difficult. Here in Boston, we get a lot more snow. Now, you know, being on the water, I think our weather is different than in Western Massachusetts, mm-hmm. but we get a ton of snow here. And uh, a few days after it stops snowing and it's still cold, then it will turn into ice. But thankfully, we don't get a whole lot of freezing rain here. So you can still drive around relatively easily. Um, but like, I, I hate being hot. I, really? I hate it. Okay. Um, do you okay. remember those Snickers commercials? Where, like, <laughs> You're not yourself when you're hungry. person becomes a diva <laughs> yeah. when they're hungry. Well, that's me when I get hot. I just get really <laughs> irritable. I really annoy myself. Honestly, fair. Like, I yeah, get it. I can tell when I'm getting to that place. I'm like, Chris, and we got to get out of here. Like, <laughs> it's happening again. It's coming out. The Jekyll like, and Hyde oh, transformation okay. begins. <laughs> yeah, because I don't care about anybody when I get to that level. It's just like, all I care about is me not being hot anymore. I, I get will it. step over anyone that I need to <laughs> right? to get into some, some AC. That's but right. <laughs> moving up to Boston has made me realize I don't necessarily like being extremely cold either. Mm, um, okay. Okay. Yeah. So like, as long as I'm, you know, bundled up and sure. that kind of stuff. And like, I have like a purpose for being outside. Sure. I can handle it. And like, I enjoy playing in the snow for like, you know, maybe 30 minutes. Okay. It's a good run. But after that, I'm like, okay, well, this is fun. It's time for me to go inside and not be in the snow. Or like, so I, when I was still going to school at Emerson, um, mm-hmm. I would have to go get COVID test weekly. Sure. And so, you know, like, you didn't have a choice if it was snowing. Well, I still had to go get my COVID test. So I had right. to deal with this. So like, I would be out there and it was fine. I, I dealt with it. There's only a few times I fell and hurt my pride. Um you know, as a 31 year old man falling in the big city where everyone sees him falling and probably right. screams, you know, um, it's a humbling experience living it's a in a rite of thing. passage, Brent. <laughs> it is. I have bled for this city. That's right. You've earned your keep here. <laughs> I have. <laughs> um, but I don't know. It's, it's, uh, it's one of those things that it's fun. I enjoy it for, you know, the first 30 minutes being outside in it after that it's great to look at from the window 
Right. Um, that's really nice. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I don't know. I guess it depends. Kind of depends on the mood. If we're gonna go out to eat uh, in downtown Boston, well, I'm gonna have to put up with the snow, and it's fine, and I have a good time. It's not gonna like prevent me from doing something most of the time. Sure. But it's not like I'm also asking to roll around in the snow either. It's right. It's a happy medium. Right. Right. And when you do roll around in the snow, sometimes it's not by choice. Yes. Yes. I it's get because it. I have fallen. <laughs> <laughs> I understand. Uh, I get it. <laughs> so you said you're from Texas. You went to I college am. in Oklahoma. Yes. Why didn't you go to college in Texas? Well, um, so I grew up. Um, I've always been a singer. Um, oh, dude. Yes. What? I did yes. not know this. I play the baritone vocal cords. Look at um, you. Yeah. Um, I... Um, I goofed off a lot in, in high school and like, I was always Rightfully smart, so. but I never really applied myself. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, okay, whatever I have to do to just pass so I can focus on the thing that I care about, which is choir. Um, and so I was always able to, you know, just pretty much really half-ass anything that I do. And I was like, okay, well, like a high B I'm fine with that. There you go. Um, and so, but while I was fine with that, schools don't really want to give you scholarships if you make like, you know, high B's and that kind of stuff. Right. Um, and so I got a music scholarship to, Dude. Um, yeah, to uh, Oklahoma Christian university. Awesome. Um, yeah. They gave me money to sing for them. Um, Get it? I did choir for a couple months, but I didn't want to be like a music major because mm-hmm. I didn't enjoy uh the 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 weeds of theory enough sure to do that for four years you mm-hmm. know makes sense and i was like okay yeah and so if you're gonna if you get the scholarship you have to do so many music classes um all this kind of stuff it's like i don't have time sure for this and the the my actual degree plan and i just i wasn't disciplined enough i was the stupid 18 year old kid <laughs> um sure and so um I stopped doing choir and I kind of was lost because like music was always my identity. That was always what I was known for. That's cool. And then, um, yeah, it was cool. Um, and then I, so at, at OC, um, so it's a private Christian college and they don't want to have like the PR crisis of having fraternities and sororities on there. So they're called social service clubs, <laughs> but, um, you know, they do Clever. the same thing. Yep. <laughs> um, but, um, we would do this thing called spring sing um, where all the clubs would like put on a, it was a competition for all the clubs. Um, Ooh, and okay. uh, you would like, you would have like a six, seven minute set where you would, there'd be like a central theme. And mm-hmm. then you would like come up with your own original lyrics, original choreography as a club. And you would sing and dance. And like is a huge bragger. It was part of the the uh, marketing and alumni and like getting money for the school. Sure. By making a competition with the clubs and that kind of stuff. Cool. And uh, I was a in between club acts. So I did it club acts uh, two two years, mm-hmm. and then one year I was a host, which meant cool. We just we'd like be in between the the club sets, and so we'd sing and that kind of stuff. Um, and after that, I. Um, I was asked to be a part of this touring acapella group. Um, Dude. Kind of like an admissions group. Yeah. So we What was the name? The, it was called New Rain. There we um, go. And um, we toured the Southwestern United States. Um, what? Yeah. It was awesome. It was one of the most fun summers ever. I bet. Um, yeah. But that is what drew me away from Texas. Oklahoma Christian said, hey, we will give you money to sing for us. And I was like, okay. You're like, I have a high B and I can also sing a high B. I get it. There you go. <laughs> was singing something that like what you were super passionate about it, like from a young age, it just like clicked. Yeah. Um, I think I probably, I, I growing up, I was extremely shy. Um, like I did not like anyone to have, like, let me just stand in the background, not cause any, um disturbances um mm-hmm. i like cried over everything if i got like <laughs> so it was funny so when i was in elementary school like i was a brain 
Mm -hmm. And so like, if I made anything below like a 95 in any of my classes, I was like, well, this is the end of the world. I'm probably going to die. Sure. And um, when I was in fourth grade, I went to a different school that my mom started teaching at. And um, I I guess having my mom at the school kind of gave me a bit of a, like a a comfort, like safety blanket. You're not alone anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's not going to let anything happen to you. So if there's something you want to try, you can try it. And so, yeah, so I was in the fourth grade and I started like doing like some of the, you know, class Christmas concerts or whatever, you know, you do in elementary school, whatever. Um, And I kind of became hooked, um, like the adrenaline rush that you get up on stage. I was like, oh, oh, wow. Right. This is nice. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) That after show Um, buzz yeah absolutely yeah yeah yeah, you know all about that after show buzz and so it kind of it's kind of like a drug you know yeah uh, it is so yeah and so I just became obsessed with performing and and doing that kind of stuff and so that really followed me all the way through college dude did you play instruments as well so I've played around on guitar like I know some chords and that kind of stuff um I'm not, I'm uh, very basic rhythm, very, sure. very basic rhythm. Um, mm-hmm. Little bass for the I, vocals. Yeah, yeah. I hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but I mean, singing has always been the, the thing. Anything else is kind of like, Oh, I can do something else, you know, right. or whatever. But it's, uh, it, I know a bit, a few chords, but yeah, but I, I I don't feel comfortable saying it. I'm a guitar player. Sure. I can play a G to a C to an E minor. Yeah. <laughs> really? That's half of the songs. It's those three chords. <laughs> Honestly. Yeah. <laughs> if you can oh, play gee, those three chords, up. there's a lot that you can play. <laughs> yeah. G is the cement of music it's everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool though. I can't seem yeah. to save my life. So anyone that can, I'm like, nice. Good for you. <laughs> and you, you said you toured all summer. Yeah, it was um, the summer after my junior year of college. Nice. Um, so, you know, it, 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 New Rain was part of the admissions arm for uh, admissions and marketing arm for OC. And mm-hmm. so there's a few other groups that would do like we had like a uh, one that was like a, a pop group that had like you know instruments and stuff. Then we had like a, a touring improv group that did it. And so mine, we were the acapella vocal group that would do it. Um, and, uh, it was funny. I was doing that around the time that the first pitch perfect dropped. Yes. And so was it was, about to uh, ask. yeah, so it's <laughs> really funny. Um, but, oh, you're in an acapella vocal band, like pitch perfect. And we're like, uh, why? Yes, exactly. Like, yeah. <laughs> Hold on a second. Uh, <laughs> Anna Kendrick, call me up. That's right. Um, <laughs> I got a cup right here. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, yeah, so so we did that that summer, and oh, it was a blast. I got to see so much of the country, and and by that time I hadn't been able to do just a whole lot of travel, um, and so we we did a lot of shows in Oklahoma, obviously, but we did some um, some in Arkansas, Texas, Kansas, and then west. So you know, Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, Arizona. Um, Nevada, California, all that stuff um, that summer. And it was a blast. I bet. Um, there's just something about seeing, you know, seeing the miles rack up while you're on the road. Yeah, of course. Um, yeah, it was, it was incredible. I have such fond memories of that. Um, ah, it was a blast. I loved it. I loved How it so much. Yeah. What were, what were some of your favorite spots? Um, so my most memorable thing on that trip was we spent July 4th in San Francisco Ooh, and yeah, nice. and, oh, it's, it was incredible. Um, I've always loved the ocean, but mm-hmm. being in Dallas, it was the closest ocean was like six hours away. So I, I didn't get to see the ocean you know, hardly ever. Right. And so now i live by the ocean but yeah. <laughs> um at the time i was like oh yeah we're gonna be in san francisco for july 4th this is awesome and you know it was funny like growing up in dallas on july 4th we're in the hun- triple digits by this time and yeah you know, while dallas isn't quite as humid as mississippi and alabama 
it's definitely not dry there. It's actually very humid. And mm-hmm. so I was like, oh, yeah, so July 4th in San Francisco. Well, you know, July is always really hot in Texas, and that's California, so it's probably going to be the exact same thing. <laughs> no, it's not. No, not especially San cold. Francisco. Especially San Francisco. It was freezing. It was not freezing. It was like <laughs> 60 degrees. And I was miserably cold, but it was so pretty there. I didn't care. Yeah. Um, and, oh, this is a cool story. So while we were in San Francisco, we'd been, we'd been walking around doing some sightseeing and that kind of stuff. And we really wanted to go do like a really nice meal um, mm-hmm. that night well, since we were in San Francisco, you know, seafood, but it's all you know, so expensive. Yep. And so what we did is we actually went to this tourist area and we put down uh, like a hat or something. And we eat, we each threw a couple, couple dollars in there and Ooh. we started doing some of our set <laughs> and people would just come by and just throw money in there, throw money in there. And I think we ended up getting like 250 bucks um, off of singing. And there was like seven of us, I think. Um, and so split that between us and we were all able to get like a $20 meal or something. Um, wow. Which, you know, for college kids, it's like, oh, yeah, this is yeah. awesome. It's literally singing for your food. You got to exactly, experience yeah. busking. Absolutely. Yeah. We did this after, or we did this outside the Gear Deli Chocolate Factory. Oh, yep. Fisherman's Wharf. Um, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, I know where so, you're at. Mm-hmm. So we got, um, so yeah, San Francisco was was by far just the, the prettiest place I'd ever been. Um, and, uh, that was definitely the most memorable thing on the trip. Um, but that was also just my first time in California. So we got to, we stayed on Pepperdine's campus in Malibu when we were in the Los Angeles area. Cool. And, um, it was just gorgeous there, you know, so many mountains and that kind of stuff And Texas, my part of Texas is super flat. So seeing all these mountains for the first time was just, you know, I was just floored by it. Um, and then that was also my first time going to Vegas too. And Vegas, cool. and, you know, just overwhelming Vegas, you know. Um, and uh, it was, it was a good time. It was one of the most fun summers I've ever had. That's so cool. Yeah, I love stuff like that. And traveling is so good for you. Mm-hmm. And just those experiences, experience is the key to life because later on it pays dividends, right? It's like experiences yeah. over stuff because then you can get the same joy thinking and talking about the things you did. Yeah. And it only gets better. That's Absolutely. So cool. And to do it so Absolutely. young as well is really neat. Yeah. Yeah. I was, I was really lucky. We didn't get to travel much when I was growing up. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, travel is, unfortunately, can be expensive. Yeah, I hear um, you. And so we didn't really do that much growing up. And so whenever I was with New Rain, um, I, I was traveling on the school's dime. And so I was like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, is there anything better? The only thing better than traveling is traveling on someone else's dime. You know? <laughs> um, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so it was just, um, it was just truly just, a, a, it, it made you feel really small, but in a good way, yeah. you know, a real humbling way. Totally. Um, yeah. So it was, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. Did you, by this point, did you have like a new sense of confidence traveling and getting like singing and stuff versus like oh, the yeah. kid you were? Yeah. How oh yeah, not? absolutely. It just went like straight to your head. Yeah. <laughs> um, and like, I, I struggled with like self-esteem and stuff growing up. Um, I feel you. And I feel like it's kind of like the, the, the creative person's. Uh, God, I hope so. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's just like the thing that that all creative people have to deal with i feel yeah um but um struggled with like really bad self-esteem growing up and stuff but like whenever i was up on stage and this is from like an early age whenever i was up on stage everything was different than like right. i was absolutely in control and like that was my zone like no one could you know, no one could touch me then like right. i was that was my place sure um and so uh and then, you know, so like you're doing that, you know, growing up and then in high school, like I was in choir, I was in this chamber choir, I was in this pop group. Um, Get it. And I was in some musicals and stuff as well and stuff. And so, you know, that, that goes right to your head, you know, it does. <laughs> and then whenever you go to college and you're touring the Southwestern United States singing, it's like, <laughs> this is awesome. I'm like, I didn't have pretty to good. try out for the group. They like, hey, we're actually down a person we saw you sing at spring sing you clearly know how to sing you clearly have stage presence 
can you help us out this this summer and i was like uh, you got it <laughs> you <don't have laughs> even better twice. you were scouted yeah. <laughs> exactly yeah so it's like how is that not gonna go to your head you know sure. <laughs> um and so uh, yeah I, I was i was full of myself um <laughs> no no confident I, right? i'm not confident. gonna lie i was <laughs> at least you at least you had the ability to back it up you know there's nothing worse <laughs> yes. than not having that back end there <laughs> <laughs> that is true that is true and we have all you know what the confidence of those people that's that's where it's at. I love yeah, that. Agreed. <laughs> How do we bottle it and then inject it? We'll fi- we'll figure it out. That's a future thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's be our business idea later on. Okay. That's right. That's right. Together, we got this. <laughs> what? Speaking of traveling, what is South Africa like? Oh my gosh! So we we went to South Africa. I think it was so I graduated from OC, and then I think OC was going to do like a pilot program to see like what a study abroad trip to, 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 so there's this country inside South Africa called Swaziland. Great name. Um, and uh, there was a school there, Africa Christian College, that had a lot of ties with um, OC and the church it was affiliated with, the, the denomination it was affiliated with. And so mm-hmm. they sent us over there to kind of see, is this a feasible study abroad place for us to, for, for us to be, or for us to do? Sure. And um, so we spent about two weeks in Swaziland, which wow. was incredible. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous country. The people there are amazing. Oh, they have this fast food place called Nando's. Nando's. I think it's a, it's a, uh, it's it, there. I think I've heard of it in the UK. Yeah, there's some places in the UK. Um, I don't remember exactly where they're he- like where they're based out of, but mm-hmm. yeah, there's places in the uk there's actually like a few locations in the states oh um, but yeah they're they're lo- big deal in the uk and then obviously you know africa and i think some other places too but mm-hmm. man if you ever get a chance to go there you have to go there oh it's so good but so swaziland had some uh, some great great food and the people there are just the the nicest people you could ever hope to hope to meet and uh, this was my first time ever leaving the country. Oh, cool. And so I was, you know, I was just awestruck, absolutely awestruck. I bet. I, I've always been really interested in other people, like how other people live, what Same. does life look like for other people that aren't like me, you know? And yeah, so that was made just, a whole show about it. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> well, my say it's a pretty interesting podcast. That's you know. A, you know. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, it was, it was incredible. And actually, so. African Christian College, one of the ways that they create revenue is they have a macadamia tree oh, what? farm there. So if you ever have macadamia nuts, most likely, well, I don't know, most likely, I don't know the entire registry of macadamia nut production. Sure. <laughs> but there's a high probability that those nuts came from African Christian College. So oh, wow. if you ever get, if you ever take a bag of, of macadamia nuts, turn on the back and see where they were harvested if it's from Swaziland and it's like, I think, well, obviously the acronym would be ACC, but I don't know if they go by ACC or African Christian college on there. Sure. But if you see that, then it came from the exact same place that I was at for about two weeks. Wow. Yeah. Um, That's cool. Really, really cool. Um, And so we went there during our summertime. I want to say it was July, like early July, I think. Mm Mm-hmm. And so since they're south of the equator, that was their colder time of the year, oh. but which was really funny. Like it was, it was like 60 degrees or something, or maybe high fifties uh, in bet- from like high fifties to like low seventies. Um, and that, I mean, you know, coming from Dallas and Oklahoma city, oh, that's an, am- that's amazing weather. That is perfect weather because yeah. back home it's in the triple digits at this time. Sure. And so we would be going to our classes and stuff and I'd be wearing like a, a button up shirt and, you know, pants and sure. everyone else would be like the students there would be wearing like parkas and stuff. And they'd be like, oh, you crazy Americans. Uh, <laughs> aren't you guys cold? And we're like, no. <laughs> right. And so we're like, you know, back home right now, it's like 45 degrees Celsius. Mm-hmm. And they're like, what? And like, yeah, so it's like, this feels amazing to us. We're, we're really happy about this. Right. Um, but so then after we, we were there, 
we had uh, we decided to to fly to Cape Town and cool. spend a couple of days there just for just to, you know for just tours, to do it just to yeah have fun and stuff totally and Cape Town is hands down it's the prettiest city I've ever been to in my really? life really um and uh, it, there's you know all all big cities have uh you know problems with homelessness and poverty and that kind right. of stuff and and it, it, we we saw that definitely we saw that but just the natural beauty of cape town is yeah. it's genuinely it's second to none i've never seen a place more pretty than wow. cape town and the weather was perfect there um the the water was so blue and you know remember I'm from landlocked Dallas. So right. I haven't seen the ocean too many times. Sure. And it was just, it was beautiful. Oh my gosh. It was so pretty. I love talking about Cape town. It was Good. The, the coolest I love thing. hearing about it. Um, and they have a lot of, of outdoor recreation to do cool. there. There's mountains and stuff. So, well, so here's something that's crazy. So they have this, this mountain, it's called tabletop mountain. And it's called that because it's very flat on the top just Sweet. like a table very creative Makes sense um yeah you, you can't miss it math checks um, out yeah and then if you drive 45 minutes you're at the beach and so that was just the wildest thing yeah to me. um and um it was um oh it was just incredible and the food there was so good oh my god yeah it was so good yeah what kind of food is it well um so being a coastal town, you know, there's a lot of really good seafood, crabs and that kind of stuff. But it's like, now you can get crabs back in the States. Like right. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to get something that was more you know, native to, to, to that area. And sure. so I got this meal. So a lot of the time we do like pizza and cheap stuff. And so we're going to have one really nice meal. Right. So we went to this restaurant called Sofrugo or Sofruga. I don't remember which one, but it was right on the water. And it was a really swanky place. We all got dressed up nicely and that kind of stuff. There you um, go. And um, I ordered this meal. It's called a springbok. Oh. And springbok is like a small, like, deer. It's not a deer. Oh, it's a springbok, okay. but it's like... A, sure. It's, it's whatever... Deer-adjacent creature? Yeah, deer-adjacent creature, yeah. Okay. Um, and it was one of the best meals I'd ever had in my life. And, like, really? I didn't know how to eat this thing. Like, what? Well, I, I didn't know, like, do you... Like, is this thing you, you, you cook all the way through like chicken or is this like beef where you have it like different levels? Like, how do you eat this thing? Sure. And I was like, just make it good. That just, <laughs> just, I'll, I'll just make it good. I don't, I don't know what you do. Just make it good. Like, okay. Yeah, we can do that. Yep. I trust you. <laughs> and yeah. And it was one of the best things I've ever eaten in my life. I still think about it and I'll look and see if there's any, like any like world markets or, or anything like that here in the states where i can find it and i've never been able to find it um okay. but it's just oh it was amazing and then like the entire meal was great and we ordered this dessert which i was really excited to try but i was trying to shoot my shot and flirt with the hostesses of course um and um it did not pan out for me <laughs> um i kept on waiting for them to add me on facebook so we could talk later on of course I never did classic um, and my friends ate my dessert um, <laughs> and i was like they're like well you, you were gone for so long i was like well that doesn't mean you can eat my food like right. <laughs> no i'm not paying for this you're paying for this you ate the my law food. of equivalent exchange brand exactly yes <laughs> um but um yeah it was just uh, it, cape town was just incredible and i desperately want to go back um and then at, so we were in cape town for about two and a half three days Mm -hmm. And then we spent a day in Johannesburg. Nice. Um, and Johannesburg is just incredible. Um, and we got to to learn more about Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela cool. there. We got to see um, uh, Soweto. I don't remember exactly how it's pronounced, mm -hmm. um, but it's um, we 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 got to have like a lot of tours of the area and stuff, and and learn about a lot of south africa's history cool because um, let's see this was probably back in 2013 and let's see i think apartheid ended in the 90s or something right uh, i don't remember exactly uh, when, recently but yeah re recently so like it was 
it, it was it was heartbreaking and really humbling to see this. Um, but Johannesburg is a beautiful, beautiful place. Uh, natural beauty there, all mm-hmm. kinds of natural beauty there. Um, we stayed at a hostel and we met tons of people from all over the world. Nice. Um, and we stayed up drinking with them for so long, just talking <laughs> about everything under the sun. Good. And it was funny, like they would find out that we're from Dallas and they could all pretty much tell by the way we talked. We were, a lot of us were from Texas. Sure. And so they all wanted to talk to us about the TV show Dallas. Uh, they're like (laughs) is that you know how you guys live and they wanted to know so much about the tv show and they were heartbroken when we had to explain hey we've never watched that show before in our lives (laughs) like what (laughs) like yeah like we we don't i don't know anything about the tv show dallas like that's not my life i'm very urban like city city boy here sure i don't i don't know who killed jr i'm sorry i don't know yes yeah yeah, I, hear I, you. I could point out JR in a lineup, but yeah. <laughs> maybe. Um, uh, side note, though, my high school choir, we took some choir pictures at South Fork Ranch where they filmed the exterior Ooh. shots of the house, which is pretty cool. Get it. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, so at the hostel, like people, we like really let them down. Um, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm sorry. Right. I just don't know. I don't know what to tell you. <laughs> sure. Um, and, uh, like the, the owner of the hostel, it was this older couple. Um, they're probably like in their seventies and let me tell you, they could drink all of us under the table. Like, yes, they kept on pouring us these shots called spring box shots. Oh, no idea what's in them, but the deer adjacent um, creature. Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, they use like this, this, there's this South African liqueur. It's called, a uh, Amarula. Oh. Okay. Um, and it's delicious. It's fantastic. Um, it's kind of like Bailey's, but it's not like Bailey's. Okay. Um, I'm down with but that. The shot had a little bit of marula in there and some other stuff. I don't know what it was, but um, it was it, it was dangerous. It was very dangerous. <laughs> and all the best people, things are. Yeah, and so it's like you know, the more drunk we got, the more other alcohol and stuff we'd buy from them. So they kept on pouring up shots and stuff. And we're being stupid college kids. You're like, oh, yeah, free shots. Right. <laughs> um, Got it. And him. yeah, and I, it was one of the most fun nights I've ever had, but I was also very sick the next morning. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. Law of equivalent exchange. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, and also, I forgot to mention, when we were in Swaziland, we got to go on an actual safari. Oh, cool. That's where you saw yeah. the elephants. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I, I saw some elephants there. I saw... It was, uh, I think we saw some, some lions. I don't remember everything that we saw, but um, sure. yeah, we got to see all this. And I actually think I got to see a spring bok before I knew that a few days later I was going to be eating one. Yeah. <laughs> um, so pour one out for the boy. Um, yep. Yep. But um, uh, South Africa, like, I, I, I genuinely cannot recommend people going to South Africa to, to experience it anymore. It's just, it's so it's just an amazing place. I loved it. Absolutely loved it. That's so cool. I love mm-hmm. stuff like that. I, I want to yeah. see, I'm a, I love animals and I yeah. just, especially like in their natural habitat. Yeah. You know, like I, I love going to zoos and things as well, but when you see it in its natural habitat, like it's it, it, yeah, you're like, you're in their world now and an mm-hmm. elephant specifically, you're like, Oh, it's just existing here. Like, how can mm-hmm. that not be a, a moment that it sticks with you for a while. Oh yeah, absolutely. So cool. Absolutely. Um, we had really long layovers in Dubai on that oh, trip. What? And so how was that on the, yeah. Uh, so we went from, so I was living in Dallas. So I flew from Dallas to Houston, Houston to Dubai, Dubai to Johannesburg, Johannesburg to Swaziland to nice. get there. Um, and we did pretty much the same trip back, but we had Cape Town in there. But um, on the way there, we had like a nine hour layover in Dubai. And so I was traveling with my friend Jessica and like, it's nine hours. And at this point it was like, you know, two o'clock in the morning at the airport. So there's really nothing to do at the airport. And sure. I'm not going to stay in there for nine hours. I'm not going to blame you. Yeah. <laughs> And so we left 
and we found this cab uh, driver. His name was a Shaquille. Great name. Um, and we said, we showed him some money. Like we want to see some cool things in Dubai. What can this get us? And he was like, get in the car. We were like, yes, sir. <laughs> and one of the nicest men I've ever met in my life. Cool. Terrifying driver. Of utterly course. terrifying. Of There's course. Many times just kind of looked at each other and we're like, it's been nice knowing you. <laughs> yeah. Nice knowing It's a good way to go out, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good yeah. way to go out. <laughs> um, but uh it was so much fun. And he uh, he I think he'd lived there his entire life, and so he knew so much about it to to tell us about and stuff. And so cool. we got to see some of the coolest sites in Dubai. Um and uh but yeah, so Dubai is really cool. Uh but it's extremely humid more human ah, than i've ever experienced so really keep that in mind if you ever visit dubai but it's it's overwhelming like well okay here's one more story about Talk dubai that's what i'm here we for were driving you know 500 miles an hour down the strip <laughs> you were flying and, yeah we're like flying in a toyota camry um and i look to my left and i see a texas roadhouse restaurant and perfect it was the weirdest thing to me because it's like and it shows like you know it's a big you know, Texas Roadhouse is a big company you know sure and so it, but it was like wait what yeah we're halfway around the world and I see Texas Roadhouse <laughs> of all things thing. of all things yeah <laughs> and like for a right Texan next to see to it Burj Khalifa and there's a Texas yeah. Roadhouse make it make sense <laughs> <laughs> you summoned it being from Texas yeah I guess so <laughs> it's your nor- your North Star <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's how you that's uh, how you you guide Texans you put that's it right up. when in Those doubt honey butter biscuits. <laughs> Butter biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> honestly worth it yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's amazing though that's how you do it that's the best way to travel though is just finding a cab be like all right show me something cool from a local you know mm-hmm. it's the way yeah it's the absolutely way. absolutely and i i love doing that and he would like so shaquille while he was driving you know he was talking to us the entire time and so he would get his phone out and show us pictures of his family and stuff on his phone while he's driving very fast in Dubai traffic. And we're like, oh, your family is beautiful. They look really sweet. Oh, y'all are an amazing family. Please pay attention to the road, Shaquille. I want you to go see your family after this car ride. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and we would like to go see our family right. after this car ride is over. Um, but um, yeah, it was an amazing time. Amazing time. That entire trip. I bet. So mm-hmm. what do you, what do you do when you come home? Because obviously yeah, that's you're weird. changed, you know. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, and like you know, going from exotic locations back to the suburbs of Dallas, which and the suburbs of Dallas, they're they're fine, they're great, you know. But it's it's not the same because I've lived here my entire life, so it's like, well, right. none of this is really new for me. But it did really open up my mind and really pushed me to explore areas that I hadn't gone to before. Um, and so it was kind of cool coming back because I kind of saw things differently. Um, sure. And it, it perspective. You know, travel helps. Yeah. It, perspective and travel helps take away fear and yep. prejudice and that kind of stuff, you know? And 100%. so, yeah, when he came back, I was like, oh, I kind of want to go check this place out, you know? And, and I tried, I branched out and tried new foods while I, while I was on the trip. And so when we came back, I was w- more willing to try new foods sure. uh, and, and learn about the, the histories and like try and learn about the people that I'm around. Texas or Dallas is, is really diverse. Um, there's um, just tons of diversity there. Cool. Um, and um, uh, thankfully food is part of that diversity right and so you know whenever you you and, and around that time i was really watching a lot of um anthony bourdain and andrew zimmer and perfect that kind of stuff their shows mm-hmm. and so i really was starting to see things a little bit differently combined with my personal experiences you know on that trip and stuff and so it was uh it was a really really cool cool time to come back and yeah just, just kind of see things differently you know sure yeah. And you said that you went to Oklahoma, but you didn't, your degree wasn't in music. What'd you end up getting a degree in? No. So, um, you know, I'd always, 
I'd always, you know, goofed off in high school and that kind of stuff, but I knew I was really smart. Mm -hmm. Um, I just didn't really apply myself. Sure. There's always like this thing that's kind of like holding me back. And so mm-hmm. when I went off to college, I was like, well, you know, journalism seems pretty cool. Um, broadcast Ooh. journalism, being on TV. Sure. Um, that's kind of like a performance mm-hmm. in a way, you know. Yep. Um, and I was always really able to, during crunch time, I would get this mental clarity and allow me to really accomplish something sure. really big at the time i didn't realize it was adhd um, <laughs> but uh i was Relatable. like well, broadcast i mean that's you know, high pressure all the time mm-hmm. maybe if maybe that's what i need you know yep. and, and being in front of a camera even though it's not a, a live audience in most cases maybe that will maybe that will kind of mimic the um the the, the feel and the adrenaline rush that i would get up on stage yeah yeah, so I, I did that for a while at OC, and then for whatever reason, oh, you know, you change your major a thousand times in college. I changed my major five times. <laughs> um, Perfect. For some reason, I felt the need to try finance for a little while. and Why not? Yeah, I, yeah exactly. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Um, and I realized how much I truly hate uh, the addition of letters into math equations. Same. Um, I was like, ah. I was taking a business calculus class. And I kid you not. I didn't make a grade above an F in that class. I, I kind of read the writing on the walls. So I was like, <laughs> eh, you know, I don't know that I would want me to be a financial advisor. Good point. Um, so I'm probably going to go back to the words of uh, communication and journalism. That's mm-hmm. much more fun. Sure. Um, and uh, so I, I think I, I, I just did communication studies when I went back. I don't think that I actually did broadcasting because um, I think by that time, like it was going to add, I was trying to get, I was just trying to be done with school. Sure. Um, and so if I did commu- or broadcast journalism, I, I I talked myself out of broadcast journalism because I was like, well, I don't want to bring my work home with me and always be thinking about work. So it's a good theory. You know, yeah, good theory. <laughs> and then it's funny, like once I get into the real world, I'm like, oh, okay, well, I think about work all the time anyway. So yep. <laughs> uh, I played myself then. Yeah, you did. <laughs> yeah. And so, but at the time I was still under that mindset. So I was like, well, I'm just going to do communications. I really like words and messaging and rhetoric and that kind of stuff this stuff's really cool to me um public relations would be cool but i don't want to add any more time to my school time here so i just want to be done Mm -hmm. um and i've kind of been contemplating law school too my uncle's a lawyer and he's always always pushing me to do that just because we're very similar and he likes being a lawyer so he's like well you're gonna like it too sure and so i was kind of thinking about that i was like eh, we'll see (laughs) <laughs> um and so i ended up graduating with a communication studies degree with a business minor um Ooh. um so that business time did pay off <laughs> for the minor at least there you go um, i can say i understand business but don't ask me any questions right yeah <laughs> in theory um, yeah <laughs> i hear you i understand what the textbook says that's right i know what that um, word means <laughs> yes <laughs> i understand debits and credits with accounting don't ask me to explain it to you yeah <laughs> um so yeah after that uh i was kind of just like in kind of like a no man's land after i graduated because sure i just like i was tired of school um i, I didn't it. really know what i wanted to do but i knew i wanted to make some money mm-hmm. and so i moved back to dallas I started working in market research. I was a project manager for them. Um, And so I would run surveys for companies or for organizations. Oh, cool. Um, So this is cool. I I ran some surveys on public opinion on Obamacare. At the time, that was what... Nice. That was the big piece of legislation that his administration was trying to push out. Right. And so I did some public opinion surveys on it. Now, I don't know if it was for the administration or not. Maybe. I don't know. Sure. But it was opinions on the the act regardless. And that was really interesting because I could see the questions that were asking and then I could see responses and stuff. And so that was really interesting. Um, And then 
I did a study for Acura, the car brand, about oh. um, cars with all-wheel steering. And I've loved the automotive world since I was a little boy. Yeah. And so I, I, they didn't tell us that I was working for Acura on this project. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd been working with the, the, the organization, the, the marketing firm that Acura contracted out to. I was working with that firm. Cool. And so we were kind of wrapping up our time. And I was like, I don't remember what the guy's name was. I was like, hey, I got to ask, is this for the Acura? I think it was the RL. I was like, is this for the Acura RL? And he, the, the line was dead silent on the other end. <laughs> and he said, how did you know that that was for the Acura RL? Right. Nobody knows that this is for the Acura RL right now. How did you know that? <laughs> I said, they found us. <laughs> Yeah, they found that. Yeah. I was like, I'm a car guy. Like, I love cars. Yeah, I know. I, I just could tell by your questions, and then something I'd I'd read from like Motor Trend or whatever. Sure. I was like, I kind of put two and two together and figured out who I was working for on this. And he was like, That's genuinely incredible. And at the time, I should have said, Hey, you should tell your people with Accurate to give me a job. Yeah. I, I didn't think about that. <laughs> um, but um, I. Dude. Yeah. It was cool. Um, and so I bounced around. I had a bunch of different jobs um, before we moved up or before you know, now. Um, sure. I can go into those later on if you want me to. Um, well, I, I do want to know, what was it like surveying something like, especially political, like to get ideas? Like how, what was that process like? It was interesting. At that time, me personally, I was kind of going through an identity crisis of my own politics. I feel and you. so it came at a really interesting time for me um, because I had like competing ideas in my mind about this study that I was doing, but I was reading these responses and um, I, I don't remember what the responses were, but you know, there's uh, just varied responses and stuff. And of course. I see things. I'm like, oh yeah, well that makes sense. I get that. I get that. Oh, I hadn't thought about it like that. You know, right. That was really, really interesting to do. Um, and it really kind of showed the interconnectivity of of really everything. You know, like yeah, we're talking about something that's going on in Washington D.C., but I'm sitting in a cubicle in Plano, Texas, um, doing the survey for them. Right. It was really, really interesting. It's a small world, but yeah, everything's connected, you know? Yeah. Um, to a certain degree. And that was really, really cool um, to, to do that. I bet. And uh, you know, just at the, the personal changes that were going on with me and stuff, like it was just a really interesting timing for everything, you know? Yeah. I kind of like that when I look back on life and I'm like, oh, got mm -hmm. it. There was a season of change here that was going on. You know, it's huh. funny, like you think about who I am now wouldn't have made the same choices that I made when I was a kid. Yeah, but I feel you. Those choices created who I am now. Uh -huh. So I, sometimes I'll kind of play with this mental game with myself. Like, would I change things about how I not came to be, but like how I got to this point? Yeah, well, I don't know that i would because that's created who i am you mm -hmm. know i feel the same so, way i wouldn't yeah. it's like even that's why when they when they always talk about like what is something you would say to your younger self i'd be like just keep going <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah it it works out eventually even the real bad stuff just keep going it gets better it's gonna get a lot worse first but it's gonna get better just keep going not like keep going don't turn left it's like no no, no. that's that's how we're it's, here it's the accumulation yes. of it all you know do wear sunscreen though. Yes. And wear sunglasses when you need to. Solid advice. Yes. Those would be the two <laughs> things I would say. <laughs> Honestly, fair. I got sun poisoning one time on my nose. Don't Ugh. recommend it. Zero out yeah. of ten. I, I don't. I, I will. I'll take your your advice. Yeah. I will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna back up your advice. Sunscreen. <laughs> <laughs> How long did you do the uh, the surveying and the and the research? Yeah. I did that for about, uh, about 10 months. Um, good amount and of time. then I was, I was like 23 at the time and I was tired of working for the man. Yeah. <laughs> um, Fair. there was this, this, so we we're set up in teams and there was this other teams leader, um, who like set like a different row for me or something. I don't mm -hmm. know, but we were, uh, it was like one morning, and I was getting off the elevator as he was getting on the elevator. 
and we did the uh you know the the obligatory hey man how's it going uh and i think he said something like uh living the dream or i think i said something like living the dream you know like the white people saying sure you know? <laughs> um and he's like yep. oh that's a shitty dream or something like that i don't remember exactly <laughs> what he said fair but he said that and i was like wow he's he's right that's and right, that truth working knife. for the man yeah <laughs> uh, and like he like he said like in a way like he'd resigned he's an older guy he was like in his later 40s um and i was 23 at the time and so like i think he'd kind of like resigned to like this is what i'm gonna be doing for the rest of my life but to right. me, i took it as oh man i gotta get out of here i can't keep working for the man you know right and so i was like you know what real estate i'm gonna be a realtor because okay. you know, I was watching a lot of Modern Family at the time, and Phil Dunphy. Sure, was, I love Phil Dunphy. Great. I was like, hey, he's got an awesome life. Like, right? I think that's what I'm gonna try. Um, and so Chris and I had just started dating at that time. Nice. And uh, her dad was a realtor at the time. Perfect. And uh, so I talked to him about it, and he's like, yeah, you should I mean, give it a shot. See what you like. See what you think about it. And so I'd saved up a good a good chunk of money, um, and I went into real estate school, got my Texas real estate license, paid a lot of money for that stupid thing. Um, <laughs> and real, like being a realtor is expensive. It's I really bet. expensive. And I just didn't save up enough money. And also like I was a 23 year old kid. Why would someone trust me sure. <laughs> to buy a house from? Like, Good it, point. come on, Brant, think about this, dude. Right. <laughs> come um, on, ask Brant. What's going yeah, on? Like, uh, All that whatever. singing went to your head. You're like, I could yeah. sell houses. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Phil Dumpy, like, you stay away from me. That's right. <laughs> um, and uh, so I tried my hand at that. Mm -hmm. um, never sold a house, never even had a client. Understandable. Um, I ran out of money and I was like, well, student loans. Mm -hmm. I got to pay student loans. Mm -hmm. um, so I just was like, okay, well, goodbye. And so this was, oh, wow, this is approaching 10 years ago. I still get phone calls and emails and text messages about real estate products and stuff. And it's like, oh, no. I, was like no, <laughs> I haven't lived in Texas in four years. I haven't done real estate in almost 10 years. I'm like, oh, yeah, we probably should take you off our list. Right. Like, well, yeah, you probably should. <laughs> if you wouldn't mind. Please leave me alone. Gosh, <laughs> I don't care. <laughs> Um, like, do you need a house no no <laughs> <laughs> yes i do you want to give it to me for free right <laughs> you do that for your Stop old pal your fellow <laughs> realtor pal <laughs> <laughs> um and um so then i started working I, I was desperate to find a job and with a you know comp studies degree like it's kind of like not as marketable as I was expecting. It's kind mm -hmm. of like a jack of all trades, master of none. Sure. And on paper, that's okay. And for some career tracks, that's fine. But that's not really what I was really wanting. Right. Um, but so I was, uh, but I was desperate for money, and so I started I working it. in IT for this uh, software company in downtown Dallas. And oh. I've always loved downtowns, like the more urban the taller the buildings the more like dense urban cool look it has the more excited i am get and it growing up any chance i got to go to downtown dallas i would always take it because i could take the train in yeah. and i would feel like i was you know some city person you know like oh i'm so <laughs> cool um and so i uh worked in downtown dallas at doing it support um for them hmm. for a while and that's different uh, yeah very different job sucked hated it um, <laughs> but uh like i got to be in downtown dallas and i was like oh i, I don't care and i was making decent money uh, sure i was like i don't care this is awesome i love this get it i, I, I hated it but it was, <laughs> i love being in dallas perfect and um then i got tired of that and so i worked for an apartment complex um doing leasing for them i was like well at least i can use my real estate license which i did not use my real estate license yeah I suck at sales uh <laughs> like i just i don't care if someone wants something or not uh -huh. like they'd always be like 
in training guys like, oh yeah, you really got to make someone want this. And I'm like, this apartment sucks. Like we're paying, <laughs> we're charging way too much money for this thing. No, I no, I'm. If someone doesn't want it, okay. Well, I'm not going to make you buy something you don't want. Right. Like, let's move on, okay? That is the opposite of realtors. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I realize, you know, <laughs> through life experience, I realize I am not a salesperson. I would not have made a good realtor. Fair. Um, yes. It's important to know uh, that. <laughs> yes. Yes. It is always good to to be self aware and understand yourself, mm-hmm. um, even if it's after the fact. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but I got to drive around in a golf cart a lot. And I got cool. to be outside a lot for my job, taking people on tours and that kind of stuff. And That's I got fun. to talk to people a lot, which I really enjoyed doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's, you know, you, you find ways to make things, you know, enjoyable for yourself. Yep. Um, and then I got a job with Liberty Mutual. Nice. Doing auto insurance claims. One of my problems um, that I'd had with a lot of my jobs because it just didn't require like brain power, like sure uh, for sales at least. Like it just, I, I, I'm, I'm a creative person, but mm-hmm. I, I want to do something that requires more, you know, brain work and stuff than sales is. And right. But we'll find creative ways to sell people things. But no, I'm still <laughs> selling things, and I don't right. want to do that. <laughs> sure. Um. Yeah. So. Ugh. And so, but. So I, I was kind of like my mind just kind of wasting. And so I started working mm-hmm. as the claims adjuster for Liberty Mutual Auto Insurance, which 10 of 10 would not recommend ever doing that. <laughs> um, oh, Liberty, you, Liberty. You, oh, gosh. Uh, <laughs> I still, I get PTSD flashbacks whenever <laughs> those commercials come on. Right. <laughs> um, like, uh, You've seen the emo in person is what you're telling me? Oh, so almost. I almost Ooh, saw it. So, um, what? I worked for claims for a while and then we moved up to Massachusetts. I did claims for a little while longer while I was in Massachusetts. Then oh. I got switched to our, or I got a job in our underwriting department, which made me end up having to work in our downtown Boston office, corporate headquarters. Oh. And that's where we lived. So that was a, an awesome, that's what I've been trying to do for a long time anyways. Sure. Um, and like the week before I started working at that office, Doug and I think that Lemu or an emu was uh-huh. there for like people to come and meet. And I was like, "Are you kidding me?" The week <laughs> before I get there, that's when there's an emu in the office. So I close, to see. yeah. Um, that's pretty cool. <laughs> that would have been really cool. So you you graduated from Oklahoma. You did a mm-hmm. bunch of different jobs. What made you go back to school? So uh, we came up to Boston for Kristen to do grad school at Emerson. And, oh, she started um, it. Yeah, so she started. Um, and I saw the, the fun, uh, well, I saw the, the, the cool stuff that she was doing with her. She did a master's in journalism, uh, multimedia journalism, I think mm-hmm. is what it was called. Cool. And that was really cool. And I like journalism, but that wasn't exactly what I was looking to do. But I did enjoy writing and thinking and that kind of stuff and we lived right by the jfk museum and so we would go over there and and his presidential library and we'd look at it and stuff we'd see a lot of quotes from him and his brother bobby Mm -hmm. i was like wow like this is awesome this is this so this is yeah 2018 Mm -hmm. and so i was like oh i really feel like i need to be doing something more to help people like actually help people not like auto insurance help people, right. <laughs> you know? Um, and so I started studying for the LSAT um, and for law school, because there's a bunch of law schools up here. Um, right. So that's what I was going to do. And I ordered a test book and I got probably like a page or two into it. And I was like, well, yeah, I want to help people, <laughs> but it's not going to be through law because I have hated every second of this. Every yeah. second of this sucks. Yep. Um, and I was like, and I don't want to do school if I can't even get to this stupid book. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I was really trying to dig down, like, what do I want to do? And public relations has always been kind of cool to me sure. um, because I like connecting with people. I like, um, uh, I, I like writing. I like being creative. There's a lot of things about it that I just find genuinely interesting. Cool. Um, but I didn't want to go 
switch my major at OC to public relations. I didn't mm-hmm. want to be, you know, really old and still doing my undergrad. So I just have put <laughs> it to the back burner. But I started doing some research into public relations departments. And, you know, there's a lot of people that didn't come from that background. I was right. like, okay, all right. So I'd been in my head about this and this is probably what I'll end up doing or what I'm going to at least go for right now. Sure. And so I applied to Emerson and I was rejected. Um, very oh. first time. I, yeah. I was rejected from and They're like, we do see while you, I, I goofed off in college a lot. I did just the bare minimum to pass. Sure. Um, and um, so, you know, they looked at my transcript and like, well, you know, he's at this point, I was 29 years old. And they're like, well, you know, I don't know if we're going to give this kid a shot. I don't know if he's really looking to, right. I don't know if he's a serious candidate. Mm-hmm. And so like, but we'll let you take one class. And depending on how you do with that class, if you do really well in that class, we'll admit you full time. That's cool. So I took a public affairs class. And I think I ended up making like a 97 or a 98. Get it. And they're like, all right. Yep. You're, you're good. You're ready. You're ready for grad school. You'll be fine. <laughs> You'll be fine with that. And I'm like, yeah, well, you're damn right. I knew That's I was going right. to be fine with this. Um, and um, as it turns out, I made straight A's all the way throughout grad school, um, except Dude. for my capstone. And I made an 86 for the Ooh. final grade for it. But for my actual thesis paper i made a 93 or something so good god um, yeah so like it was uh i i think that i proved my uh, ability to do grad school yeah um, by the time that i finished but yeah i actually finished that up um a little over a month ago now you did congratulations yes. thank you that's insane so i barely happy. graduated high school so that's <laughs> nuts <laughs> well i it was it was an experience. It was, it was really tough. Uh, it was really, really tough. Um, I bet I, it's called yeah. graduate school. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I was, I was really happy to be finished. I like I said, I ADHD. Um, and it's really like, I it really same kind of, um, Oh, you have it as well. Oh yeah. It sucks. <laughs> yeah. It does suck. It's awful. And I think by this, by at this point is two and a half years or two years in a pandemic. And like, I was uh-huh. actually at my, and I've been at my limit with it. Mm-hmm. And you know how that just ag- your, aggravates your ADHD even that more, uh-huh. that much more. And so it was like, I, whatever it takes to be finished with a stupid thing, I'm done. I am done. Sure. Um, and uh, turns out, you know, it worked out really well for me. Right. <laughs> I'm glad that I did it, but <laughs> yeah, it was just, it was really, it was a really tough time. Um, I, I didn't know that adult ADHD really existed. Mm. And so I was like, well, I figured I probably grew out of it from when I was 14 and I took medicine for it. Sure. I was like, what's, what's holding me back, you know, in, in my you know, life and career and that kind of stuff. And sure. uh, so um, it just really kind of came to a head these past couple years, um, who coincidentally right with grad school. Funny how that works. Yeah. Um, Trial yeah, by fire. So, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and so finally, finally worked out for me and I was very, very happy about it. Let me tell you. <laughs> Get it. How yeah. do you, because I have no concept of that reality. How do you go about choosing a thesis? Like, do you just get to do it on anything or is it within the parameters of the class here? T- is it to a class? How does this work? So, uh, Emerson, they do more of a capstone as opposed to a thesis. Okay. Um, and a capstone can be, you know, it can be over whatever you want to do. Okay. Um, and I have always been interested in rhetoric, word choice. Yeah. The meanings behind phrases, the ideas that phrases and words put into minds. Sure. Um, <laughs> what a dog whistle I've, is. <laughs> Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, I hear you. Um, conspiracy theories, propaganda, disinformation, that kind of stuff is mm-hmm. fascinating to me. Um, not to, to participate, <laughs> in, but to see why it's a good time work. for it. <laughs> yeah, you're really, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and that's largely, um, you know, the stuff that we would see from 2015, yeah. 2016. Facts. That was really 
it's showing like oh wow this is crazy like this a is thing fascinating yeah it's truly a thing i didn't realize how big of a deal it was and also that kind of coincided with my own personal life and as i was changing my views and seeing sure. like, oh this thing that i believed well that there's a re this is why i believed it and mm-hmm. it's not necessarily accurate but i fell victim to something sure um and then just growing up um, i grew up evangelical sure. uh, christian and a lot of the people that i knew believed in like new world order type things global conspiracies whatever that kind of uh-huh. stuff. i never believed that stuff I, I never thought that that stuff was real sure but there was a lot of people that i did know that did believe that kind of stuff right and so once i started doing grad school um so i emerson has um public relations political communication and sports communications all under the communications and public relations uh Uh, umbrella gotcha and so when i started doing it i wanted to do automotive public relations that's what i wanted to do makes sense yeah yeah Mm -hmm. i love cars um and so i um but i was really interested in propaganda and that kind of stuff so i was like so i want to take some political classes too i've always been really interested in politics same um in the words of Connor Roy from Succession, Brent Russell is interested in politics from a very <laughs> young age. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, but um, uh, as as time would go on, and so during the the 2018 midterms, I was like, "Wow, this is this is fascinating." Yeah. And as much as I like the automotive world, I think that I need to use my talents and my privilege in the political world. I think that I can do more good for more people in oh, that yeah. world than I can in the corporate communications world. Right. Um, and so I, I really started learning more about the disinformation, that kind of stuff. And then th- that was, so my second semester of grad school is when COVID hit. And ah. yeah. And I'd heard about QAnon before uh, then. Yeah. Um, it, what's funny for Kristen's capstone for her thing, she was wanting to like interview some QAnon people, and I was like, "No, Kristen, you can't do that. <laughs> These people are crazy. You can't too close do that. to the fire. <laughs> yeah, you can't get too close to them." And then here I am, really interested in that stuff, researching this all the time. So, right. like, <laughs> as a little hypocritical of me, I understand that right. I didn't I'll go into it. it to be hypocritical. <laughs> I went in it with honest. I want to protect you. Right. <laughs> um, but um, so I got really interested in how people were, were using the COVID lockdowns, the um, X, Y, Z, um, mm-hmm. as this is actually a plot to do something else. Right. And so that became really, really interesting for me to learn about what's going on. Why is this working? And then what are our political candidates? What are, what are they saying or what are they not saying that helps push narratives and not just QAnon, but just conspiracy theories and, and, and political beliefs in general. What is being said that forms these beliefs? That's what I find really interesting. Yeah. Um, and so I'd been doing this for, you know, by this point, a year and a half. And so it made more sense for my capstone. So like, well, I really enjoy rhetoric. I, I enjoy learning how information spreads. So it makes sense for me to do a something about rhetoric for my capstone. Right. And so I'd really been trying to figure out what did I want to do? One of my good friends um that was in the program he's a marine veteran and he did this really really interesting uh project it was about fascism and and how it relates to like military uh the military i don't know exactly what it was about sure his was so good and so i was like dang like i've the pressure is on (laughs) he set the bar pressure or anything but yeah in a way it's like i mean his 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 he did a podcast and he wrote some things about it and stuff nice man like i don't know what 
what am I going to do that is on the level of what a capstone is supposed to be? Yeah. And I, so I kind of was talking to my, uh, my advisor about this and she was like, you might want to look into, she, she was saying, don't think about what other people are doing. There's none of theirs Good matters. Advice. Only matters is what you're doing. She was like, you're interested in rhetoric. So a rhetorical analysis would be a good idea for you, especially if you're wanting to go on to do PhD, which is something that I was highly considering at the time. I'm still vaguely considering it now. Sure. Um, but um, uh, she was like, so it would be a good idea to do a rhetorical analysis and build a base foundation for later research. And so I didn't, like for me, I didn't like, you know, just pop into my head. I want to do a rhetorical analysis of evangelical rhetoric. Sure. It was just a buildup of it. I, I saw a stat. Um, it was over the summer before I started this, this research. And uh, I believe the number was something like 23% or 22% of white evangelicals believe in QAnon. Wow. And that's a I was high like, number. <laughs> yeah, it's a really high number. And so I knew I wanted to do my capstone on that, but I didn't know what that meant any further than I want to do my capstone on why does this happen? Right. So that that's kind of how it came about as formed over wow. the process of, of the pandemic to be sure. honest. <laughs> and what, what did you learn? So what, what was difficult is, is I, I, we all want that instant gratification. You know, we want to be able to have the answers and part of being an academic is saying this paper, I got to figure out what is the point of this paper? Right. Um, i had been looking at a lot of the literature and I follow a, to a ton of journalists and other academics who study communications and that kind of stuff. Cool. Um, and they're wonderful. Fantastic. I've learned tremendous amounts of uh, amounts from them, mm -hmm. but I didn't really see people talking about, evangelical rhetoric and how that relates to a lot of the rhetoric we see in these far right-wing conspiracy theories mm -hmm. growing up in evangelical churches i remember a lot about what what was said in them yeah and uh, there was this one sermon i heard something about it was like uh, we've really got to be careful and defend our faith against this secular godless world Mm -hmm. um, because they're coming to attack us, something along those lines. Yep. And at the time, I was like, "No, like <laughs> we live in this secular world. Whenever we step outside of these doors, and literally nobody gives a shit yeah. what I believe, as long as I'm not hurting other people based mm -hmm. on those beliefs. Like yeah. you're making people scared for no reason. Mm -hmm. Um. And so I um. So I, I wanted to talk about like, I, that's how I felt when I heard those sermons, but other people don't, other right. people don't feel that way. And my question was, is some of the rhetoric that we're hearing, is this making people more open to conspiracy theories, to this extreme rhetoric? If they hear these ideas on Sunday mornings for however many years they go to church, does that make uh, the Democrats are holding a child sex trafficking ring out of a pizza parlor in DC. Does that make that more easy to digest? And so what this project was, is I wanted to find themes in evangelical sermons um, because this was my first step. I wanted to introduce my readers to the world of evangelical rhetoric. Right. I can't, get to that touchdown right now that's not what this paper was supposed to do and that was sure. tough i wanted to throw that hail mary into the touchdown into the right. end zone <laughs> and, and and get that that score right then but that's mm -hmm. not what this was for and it's not wise to do that because you get money whenever you publish things and the more you publish the more of a rapport you get and the more influence you get so you you know it's it's you want to have a, a large body of work. And if you go for the end zone right now, well, you kind of shoot yourself in the foot. Right. You give yourself more content to, to work on, to learn. Sure. Um, and so that was a tough pill to swallow. I'll, okay, first off, how dare you? 
Um, <laughs> but also you're right. And I'm thankful that you said this to me and that mm-hmm. I listened to you. Right. Um, so what I did was I found four general themes in this sermon series uh, from this, uh, this church. And uh, this happened to be a church that I'd gone to a few times. It was in suburban Dallas. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I was saying, I, I really wanted to make people aware of some of the themes that were in this church. This was sure. not a comprehensive explanation of, of the, the rhetoric there. It's just, what was this sermon series? What did right. they say in this one? Sure. So there was about seven series, and seven sermons in this series, and the the occurred from I believe it was September of twenty one, like early September through like mid October, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it was very timely, very relevant. Um, and I was like, and this is awesome. This is exactly what exactly what I'm wanting, right? You know. So I wanted to to introduce people. Um, what I did is there is this rhetorician from the sixties, his name is Kenneth Burke. Mm -hmm. He did this thing called a cluster analysis. So with a cluster analysis, it it notes what subjects cluster around other subjects. And it's useful because you're wanting to, to establish common rhetorical themes. Mm -hmm. Um, and because this is a foundational paper, I can then say in later papers, as we learned from my first paper in this, we know that this is a bit of rhetoric that is found in churches, Mm -hmm. Um, uh, that kind of stuff. So with this, um, I, I was able to find four common themes based on rhetoric. So you have either or statements, Uh you have uh, statements where you reject empathy you have themes where you inject paranoia like like i was saying earlier the world is out to get us sure and then you have phrases that are used to isolate the audience from outside uh outside voices uh. and what was really interesting about this is how all of these work together oh and it's terrifying to be honest. Yeah. Communication is mind control and you can get pretty much anybody to believe just about anything, depending on how you communicate it to them, which is terrifying. And in a world of social media and like the gratification you get with likes and shares and comments and that kind of stuff. Sure. It's really easy to, to push narratives and get people to get emotional and stop using reasoning. Sure. Sensationalism at its finest. Exactly. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Um, and so that's that's what I studied. And, and I found it just fascinating. Yeah. Propaganda and persuasion and how that plays into rhetoric is so interesting to me. Actually, I've got a story to tell you. Talk to me. So... Over Christmas break, um, so I finished up this paper uh, on December 14th, and then l- that weekend we went down to Dallas for Christmas and New Year, mm-hmm. uh, and um, we were talking with this this guy that we know, who, he's an older guy, he's probably like in his mid-60s, something like that, sure. and he works for a pharmaceutical company, Ooh, and Perfect. he was, yeah, he was... Uh, he he's very much on the right, uh, right uh, Republican, very conservative, mm-hmm. and which anybody on any side of the political spectrum can fall for conspiracy theories. Totally, absolutely. And at that, on that same token, anybody on any side of the political spectrum can reject conspiracy theories. Mm-hmm. Um, that's very important to to know that it's not like, Hey, my side is smarter than your side. Right. (laughs) Absolutely not how it is. Still full of people. Yes, Mm. exactly. It's full of people that that's exactly it. It's full of people. (laughs) Um, and, um, so he was telling, he was like, yeah, my uh, company, yeah, they posted uh, a record profits, but 
I've been laid off because I'm an old white guy and they're wanting to be woke. Mm. And that was interesting. Right. That he said that. Right. It's a very specific because, choice of words. <laughs> very, yeah, very specific choice of words. And that goes to show how propaganda works. Right. The media that he consumes has told him that woke culture is the cause for people losing jobs. It's the cause for X, Y, Z number of societal ills. Sure. But he also said that his company posted record profits Mm -hmm. since the pandemic has begun. Right. So is the problem woke culture or is the problem your company made so much money they've also figured out a way to cut their costs by laying off people with the most experience and hiring younger people that can be hired for less money Mm -hmm. and that's how propaganda works right it it dangles something shiny to attract your attention while and says hey you should blame this when this actual problem is the cause for something right but if you give if you give someone an enemy to begin with our brains are lazy and it's like oh i have my answer here and then yeah that's it absolutely uh in in one of my classes in grad school is for political communication i studied uh populist rhetoric oh um and it was really interesting to see how Populist rhetoric, um, it, it, it's really interesting in how it can work. Just because someone's a populist does not mean they are a conspiracist or anything. Absolutely mm-hmm. not. Sure. But there are extremes that you can push any rhetorical style and get to bad territory. Sure. If you push populist rhetoric to its most extreme, you get QAnon. You get, um, you get, ideas because what populism does is is us versus them right if i can make this group of people be mad at a different group of people and say that other group is the reason why this is happening Mm -hmm. i can make them do anything classic divide and and conquer absolutely that's Mm -hmm. absolutely it and uh i it just makes my ears perk up instantly whenever I hear a politician using these kinds of, uh, of phrases because, yeah, uh, Wall Street CEOs are taking money away from the working class. Well, mm-hmm. yeah, and there's some bits of truth to everything that you see. Like, I, I can't say, yeah, you're wrong on this because you're using populism because they're right. not. <laughs> they're, the grain know, they're of truth wrong. makes it go down easier. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But, and that's how conspiracy theories work. In right. general, a grain of truth makes it go down easier. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, whenever you use that rhetoric to demonize and dehumanize mm-hmm. the them of your equation, that's when you run into a problem. And right. that's, that's the rhetoric that really triggers my attention that I really pay attention to. Um, and uh, uh, so let's see, this was, that class was in, what was that? December of, that was spring of 2019, I think. No, spring of 2020, I think. Um, and right so, when the world crashed. <laughs> yes. And that was when Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders were functionally the last two democrats in the uh in the the primary right and they both represent completely different styles Mm -hmm. uh, rhetorical styles and so i examined the the rhetoric on their twitter accounts um and um uh it was it was really really interesting to 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 do that from a rhetorical standpoint Mm -hmm. um but um it's um yeah like it's just communication is just fascinating to me i didn't realize that i loved communication so much but it's genuinely the most important thing really in society i can't 
I, I can't explain complex ideas without communicating to you. And if I suck at communicating, uh, we're never going to get anywhere, you know, and That's that true. goes from politics, but that also goes in your job as an actor. If mm-hmm. your director cannot accurately and <sighs> adequately talk to you for real how are you supposed to know what to do you know I, i've been on those sets Ugh. yeah <laughs> and as an actor you're trying to communicate an idea to me the audience mm-hmm. if you're not able to communicate that well eh, not a very good actor there. yep exactly mm-hmm. and so i i didn't realize this as a you know when i was at oc but i've always loved commu- communication it's fascinating to me how one word can completely change the meaning of something yeah um and so uh, communication is, is just it's cool it's terrifying it is because <laughs> the it power can be used for you know the some of the worst things known to man yeah but it can also be you know used for good things it all depends on the person that's doing it and it's just it's fascinating it's truly fascinating to me and rightfully so and I'm yep. glad there are people that find it fascinating because that's how you find truths. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's got to be people that are willing to to get into the mud about this kind of stuff, you know? Um, right. And I, I just, I feel that, um, it, well, I was talking about instant gratification earlier. I, I think mm-hmm. that it, I fall for that too. You know, even sure. though I study communication and rhetoric, yeah, I, I'm not immune to it. I'm a human being. Right. And I think that we need more people that are willing to figure out why things are working the yeah. way that they are. I'm talking politics, business, anything, whatever the case may be. You need people that can get into there and figure out why is this message working? Um, is this message good? Right. <laughs> why is it working? <laughs> How can we change narratives? Sure. Um, I just think we need more people that are willing to do that kind of work, you know? I agree. It's the only way to grow, really. Exactly. That's yeah. sort of reflection. Yeah, not, and being selfish, it's the only way to grow as a person. Right. You know? Absolutely. Yeah. For when you're doing like surveying for political issues and now doing a thesis on rhetoric, do you see the world differently now? Yes. Yeah, is it, absolutely. Is it a net positive? <laughs> um, <laughs> it's... It, it, uh, Mixed bag, I imagine. That's a tough question, Brian. That's what I do. <laughs> I, I think, damn. Um, I know, right? How do you like you it, Brent? S- <laughs> I don't. I don't like this. I, I do the rhetorical thought and analysis. Right. You can't ask me these questions. Sure. Um, I, I, I look at the world in a deeper way now. Okay. I, I look at words and I look at rhetoric in a deeper way now. Sure. Um. Not necessarily in a good and a bad, because I do genuinely believe, I, I don't think that you can say that anyone is pure evil and you can't say that anyone's pure good. Totally. It's the yin yang of it all. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And yes, I have just finished Daredevil season three where they talk about pure evil and like no one's purely bad. And that kind of right. Stuff. So <laughs> yes, of course, some of these words, I'm thinking about this right now. Yeah. But um, it's, um, uh, I, 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 I look at messages from candidates and I'm saying, what picture are they trying to paint right now? Right. Um, how can, how can this be interpreted? What are the myriad of ways this can be interpreted? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's hard to not be cynical about yeah, it. I feel you. Um, because I feel so often if something can be taken in a negative way, it's probably going to be taken in a negative way. Right. But um, I, I don't think that it necessarily needs to be. Mm-hmm. I think that, I think that we, I think that we should try and search for the humanity in everyone. Yep. Um, and being human. I mean, I think I'm a pretty good person, but yeah, I'm not always good. You know, I, I'm a human and I make mistakes. Everyone mm-hmm. makes mistakes. Yep. Politicians are no different. And if I had the limelight on me and people hanging off every single word that I said, yeah, I'd probably say some stupid things that I didn't <laughs> intend for yep. or whatever. You know, that's the humanity in us. Sometimes we just fumble over our words. Right. And so I can't say that I look at things 
in a positive or negative light. Mm-hmm. I guess I, I look at something from a, the public relations studies that I've done have made me kind of look into what are the possible negative side effects of what I'm hearing. Got it. And you how think big can, picture. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it makes me look at a big picture from a cynical way because right. I, that's when you got to manage things. You know, you have crisis communication, but that's a class that I studied. I, I took a class in that, which is fascinating, but you don't have a class for good times communication studies, you know? Sure. Um, so okay. I, good I, I news doesn't that, sell. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and good news is just good news. There's right. really nothing really to manage with good news. Oh, that's a good point. I've never thought about that. Bad yeah. news has repercussions. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> bad news out. has repercussions. So whenever I hear people talking, I'm thinking, how could this possibly be negatively taken and what can be done to stop that? Interesting. So that's PR. I guess, <laughs> yeah, I guess in a way I, I do kind of look at things from a cynical way, mm-hmm. but it's not because I would necessarily want to be cynical. Right. There's not it's like an emotional of, attachment to it. Yeah. Yeah. I feel. Yeah. You. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a good way of saying it. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. So you, you know, communication. I'm just not very good with words. So I just speak from the heart, Brand. <laughs> and I love that. You know, can't this this is the yin and yang of it, you know? <laughs> You're what people will call a professional. <laughs> I come uh, in with no notes. <laughs> so as someone then who has just done a thesis, I don't know if you can answer this one because it's so everyone's is so different. Mm-hmm. Do you have like a pro tip or a piece of advice to someone who may be going into their thesis? Theses? What's the plural of thesis? I think it's theses. Theses? I think That's a fun word to say. I don't know exactly theses. what it would be. I hope it is. Theses, pieces. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Reese is really trying to launch that product. They, they didn't have the same. same no, uh, they didn't have the big picture idea. No, they didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> I like that. That was good. Um, ooh, so if I had some advice... Um, I'm going to have to give some advice to someone who's neurodivergent. Perfect. Um, Just because you're neurodivergent does not mean you're not capable of anything that people that are not neurodivergent are. Hell yeah. It will just be more difficult for you. Mm -hmm. But that does not mean it's impossible. I survived and I did really, really well. Yeah, I Um, did. Trust that you're where you need to be and that you deserve to be where you are Um, like that because uh at least for adhd you have so much negative self-talk and you'll see other people you'll constantly compare yourself so there's this uh woman i follow on twitter um she's a rhetorical uh studies grad student too and uh the discipline I know that social media is, it, it, you can say whatever you want to on social media, but it looks like the discipline that she has is just astronomical in mm-hmm. being able to do things. And I constantly would be finding myself like, wow, she's doing this. Like, come on, Brant, you can't, you haven't even been able to read this scholarly article that you need to read. Right. And she's over here doing whatever it is that you know she was doing at the time. Mm-hmm. And I would find myself comparing her, comparing myself to her. I'm like, wow, I'm shitty. I'm, why am I even in grad school? I don't deserve to do this. Mm -hmm. And it was really, really tough to do. And sometimes I was easier at fighting that off than others. But part of, 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 uh, you know, the ADHD is it's hard for me to um, buckle down and get something done until it is crunch time. Um, And so, advice i would give to someone is you're gonna do that you're gonna compare yourself to other people it's gonna happen you can't help it Mm -hmm. but just know that everyone's path is different um you deserve to be where you are and do what you can when you can 
give yourself a break. Yes. Give yourself a break. Be nice to yourself. <laughs> yeah. Um, try and, and try to stop negative self-talk. Right. Um, if you catch yourself doing it, say, okay, I'm going to stop it. Um, also, <laughs> get some fresh air. Yeah. <laughs> Walk outside. <laughs> Walk outside. Um, help it along a little. <laughs> help it along a little. Um, get some dopamine. <laughs> there you go. Uh, and, uh, and, and just keep going. You're where you need to be. I love that. Well, we've been talking for over an hour and a half already. You survived. <laughs> this is cool. This is cool. I You're was still nervous. alive. Like, yes. <laughs> this is my first podcast I've ever done before. That surprises me because you did a very good job. <laughs> As if I know what a good podcast is. <laughs> well, you've had what, 170 of these? 170. I think you're 174. Something like okay. that. I don't know. I don't keep track. But dude, <laughs> this was great. I'm so glad that you agreed. Uh, I will say you were a special request uh, by Kristen. Because <laughs> I asked, I was like, all right, who's the most interesting people you know I need to get to know? And she put your name in. I was like, how has this not popped into my head already? Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> and then you were writing a thesis. So I'm glad that this happened. And this was really fun and super, if I might say, interesting. <laughs> One might say. <laughs> it's a good time. Uh, Brian, dude, you're a great host, man. You no, stop like, it. like I said, I was nervous before this, but you're so easy to talk to. Uh, I'm cutting that out. Uh, so <laughs> <laughs> I I appreciate it. Um, so is is your paper, is that a public thing? Or is uh, that a project thing that no? No, it's I don't know how a, this works. Like so if I, what I, I, I needed a break from this paper or I was going to start seeing red and breaking things. <laughs> Understandable. Um, and so I would like to go back later and make some edits um, mm -hmm. to it. Some things that I've had some time to think on um, over the month. Um, sure. But um, if anyone wants to read it, just send me a DM on Twitter and I'll send it over to you as it is right now. Um, I'm a okay with that. Um, but I would eventually like to publish it when I, and that's a part of that, you know, that negative self-talk you have, oh, it's not good enough to be published. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I would like to publish it at some point. Um, I'm really interested in, in teaching uh, at the collegiate level. Cool. Um, and part of that is then you got to publish papers like ah, you know, gotcha. <laughs> your life depends on it. So yes, I, I do plan to do that. Um, and so, but it's kind of weird, like you can publish them, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's public where anyone can just go and read it anytime they want to. You got to like oh. pay like 30 bucks for it. And it's like, well, no, I just want to read one article. I don't want yeah. to pay 30 bucks for this thing. Weird. So huh. viewers, if you want to read this thing, just send me a DM. And I'll yeah. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, where can people find you online? Where can they find your stuff? Um, well, I am on, uh, twitter.com. Um, it is at Brant Russell, B R A N T R U S S E L L. Um, I'm on Instagram at the same name. My name is very uncommon, so that's typically where you're going to find me. It's just Brant Russell. Get it? Not Russell um, Brand. Mm -hmm. And if you have trouble saying Brant, say Brent like you're from Texas, <laughs> and people will overpronounce it, and it works every single time. It's embarrassing, but it works really well. <laughs> Look at that. Two pro tips. I love it. Stick the landing. <laughs> Dude, this was great. And... Hello, friends. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it's at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. You can also find me at BrianBalance.com. There you'll find all my demos and a bunch of other fun stuff. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. A good rating or review always helps and is greatly appreciated. Let the people know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch! 
Just search The Interesting Podcast on tpublic.com to get you some sweet gear. Also, I've got a Patreon, so if you'd like to support the show more directly, you now have that option over at patreon.com slash jedibrian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Xavier, and Victor. Your support means so, so much, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.